the Lexus LFA, Toyota 2000 GT, Lotus Elise, Ford Taurus SHO, Volvo S80, all are cars with amazing, iconic engines. And all of them are lies because those engines weren't made by the brand with the badge at the back. They were made by a piano company. So let's dig into the story of Yamaha and find out how they went from making your grandma's piano to making the greatest engines of all time. I'm Guff, this is Albon, let's get started. The story of Yamaha begins with the man himself, Torakusu Yamaha. Born in 1851, he was the son of a samurai in the Kishu clan. And the young Yamaha was a bit of a bookworm, and he would use his father's access to books to feed his fascination about technology and machinery. But before you get ahead of yourself and assume that he started building cars, no. Torakusu Yamaha became obsessed with watchmaking. So much so that by the time he got into his 20s, he was already an expert watchmaker. But you see, Yamaha wasn't the type of guy who could sit idle for long. And so, after mastering watches, he decided he needed to take on another venture. Now, you're probably thinking, this is where his love for cars comes in. But no, medical equipment. He got into medical equipment. He moved to Osaka to study medical equipment and even lived behind a medical equipment store. And by the time he was 35, he was making a decent living fixing medical equipment for hospitals and clinics in his small little village. But being a small village, he outgrew the city's medical centers pretty quickly. So he started taking up odd jobs here and there. And that decision to become a freelancer, well, that was the decision that changed his life forever. You see, a local elementary school had asked Mr. Yamaha to fix a broken organ that was at the school. The town was so small, they assumed he was probably the only one qualified to fix such a thing. And so he took on the job. And when he started repairing it, something sparked inside of Yamaha's mind. You see, there was just something so beautiful about this organ. It was mechanical, logical, like the machines that he regularly repaired. Yet, it still had so much soul so much magic in the way that it functioned. It was as if he could hear the music playing in his head as he turned those wrenches. And that's when he realized there might be a future in this. In 1887, him and a colleague built the first ever Japanese-made reed organ, and it was awful. Seriously, it was so bad that Yamaha decided he needed to move to Tokyo. Why? Well, because there was a university in Tokyo with a huge music department. And so he took his homemade reed organ to the universities, and the professors listened to it, and they told him, maybe you should sit in on our classes. And so for a month straight, Torakusu Yamaha sat in at these music lectures. And once he felt it was right, he went back home and built the second version of his reed organ. And this one was good, just as good as the ones from abroad. And so in that same year, 1887, Torakusu Yamaha founded his first company, the Nippon Gaki Company Limited, the very same company that would later go on to be called Yamaha Corporation. The company logo, a phoenix holding a tuning fork. Nippon Gaki went on to make 250 organs for schools all around Japan, and they became an instant success. The company grew and grew, and by 1900, Yamaha was even making pianos. And as the company grew, his notoriety grew as well, and all his fellow countrymen recognized him as a great leader of the community. He even got a Japanese Medal of Honor in 1902, but it wasn't to last. In 1916, tragedy struck, and the legendary Torakusu Yamaha passed away of an illness at the age of 65. Now, all this happened to be during the First World War, and it just so happened that Germany was home to the largest harmonica makers of the time. The Yamaha Corporation, now being led by their vice president, knew that nobody would be buying their harmonicas from a central power, and so Yamaha started making their own harmonicas for the Allied nations. And turns out, this was one of the best business decisions they could have ever made. People were buying Yamaha's Japanese-made harmonicas like crazy. I guess harmonicas were just really popular then. And by 1920, the company grew to employ over a thousand workers. They were producing 10,000 organs and over 1,200 pianos a year. Not too long after that, World War II happened. Japan was on the Axis side this time, but nevertheless, they were still tasked with helping with the wartime effort. But instead of harmonicas, they used their expertise in machinery to provide fuel tanks, propellers, and even wings for Japanese Zero fighters. And this being Yamaha, they really put their hearts into it. And it wasn't long before they became one of Japan's leaders in metallurgical technology. Of course, the war didn't last forever. We know what happened with that. And after World War II, Genichi Kawakami, the company president, decided it was time to repurpose that wartime machinery for something better, something more productive than just tools of war. What they made 
were motorcycles. Yeah, Yamaha started making motorcycles and they were pretty damn good at it. They launched in 1955 with a 125cc single cylinder two stroke bike based on German DKW bikes and they called it the YA1. And the YA1 was a winner from the very start. In the very same year it came out, they entered the bike into the Mount Fuji ascent and it won its class. And then it swept the podium with a first, second and third place finish at the All Japan Auto Bike Endurance Road Race. The bike was so successful that the Yamaha Corporation decided they were gonna make a whole new sub-brand just for a motorcycle, Yamaha Motor Company Limited. The motorcycle brand was now split from the instrument making brand under the Yamaha umbrella. And over the years, the motorcycle lineup started to grow. Next was the YA2 in 1957. It was another 125 two-stroke, but now with a much better frame and suspension. Then came the YD1, basically the same thing, but now with a 250cc two-cylinder. And after that came the performance model, the YDS1, using the same 250cc engine, but now with a five-speed transmission. The first five-speed transmission in any Japanese motorcycle. This pivot was proof that Yamaha had a real ability to adapt and diversify. They went from Mr. Yamaha being a watchmaker to fixing medical equipment to fixing reed organs, then making stuff for wars. So it only made sense for them to keep investing in research and development on new things. Not just motorcycles or musical instruments, but anything in engineering. So in 1959, Yamaha Technical Laboratories was established. They studied materials, acoustics, electronics, applied physics, and most notably, the internal combustion engine. And Yamaha's president was so dedicated that he made it a company policy to invest one third of all profits into this research and development. And one of their projects was a full-fledged, high-performance sports car. They first showed it off in 1961, and it was called the Yamaha YX30. It was a two-door coupe powered by a 1.6 liter all-aluminum dual overhead cam engine. Yamaha's first four-stroke engine ever, and it made 88 horsepower during testing. Not bad, but their ventures into automobiles was cut short. The economy was shaky and profitability in the market was questionable at best. And in February, 1962, the entire department was broken up. But the engineers that worked on the YX30 were hell bent on making a sports car. They knew they had the engineering down pat, they just needed financial backing to make this car become a reality. And so the Yamaha engineers took the YX30 and went to Nissan with a pitch. You see, Nissan was looking to update the current Fair Lady line with a more modern sports car that could compete with international competitors. Lucky for them, Yamaha had just the thing, a updated version of the YX30 called the A550X. And Nissan loved it. They were totally on board. And for two years, Yamaha worked with Nissan on various designs and prototypes. But but in 1964, two years after the partnership started, Nissan just said, you know what? Nah. Apparently Yamaha's new car and engine designs just weren't up to snuff for the Nissan execs. And so Nissan just scrapped the project and kicked Yamaha to the curb. Years of testing and developing the perfect sports car gone to waste. But those same engineers that couldn't let the original YX30 die, sure as hell couldn't let this die either. And so Yamaha came up with one last Hail Mary. They were gonna pitch the car to Toyota. Now, Toyota had been wanting to build a real sports car after seeing all the success of their American and European counterparts. And as soon as the Yamaha boys showed them the prototype, Toyota took one look at it and accepted the proposal. Thus beginning one of the greatest automotive partnerships of all time. If you like watching Albon videos and you're part of the 86.7% of people who haven't subscribed yet, please do consider subscribing. It's right below the like button. Toyota was to handle the chassis and style and Yamaha was tasked with giving it a fitting power plant. Now, developing an entirely new engine would take quite a bit of time and money. So Yamaha looked to the Toyota parts bin for a good starting point. The chosen patient was the Toyota M engine, a two liter inline six from the Toyota Crown. Now, the Crown was a full size sedan and not exactly sporty and the engine that tugged it along made 108 horsepower. So Yamaha lifted the cylinder head, promptly threw it in the trash, and started from scratch. Gone was the dinky single cam and in its place, a free-flowing aluminum dual overhead cam system with large wide valves and free-flowing ports. Add to that an aluminum sump and a triple Mikuni carburetor set. And this new straight six made a hearty 148 horsepower. That may not sound like much in these days, but that was a 40% improvement over the Crown's base engine, all with just a little head work. Toyota was thoroughly impressed, and when it all came together, it was truly a masterpiece. They called it the Toyota 2000 GT. And that car is now considered the original Japanese supercar. The 2000 GT was hand-built in Yamaha's own Iwata factory. And when it finally hit showrooms, 
It wasn't cheap. An MSRP of $6,800 meant that this little Super Coupe was more expensive than Porsches and Jaguars at the time. And despite that, Toyota didn't even make a profit on the project. What they did gain, however, was an amazing partnership with a company that clearly had something special to offer. So Toyota doubled down and went back to work with Yamaha on the 1600 GT. This was a special sporty version of the Toyota Corona, and its goal was to be a junior version of the 2000 GT for far less money. Once again, Yamaha took the existing Corona 4R engine and developed the 9R, a souped up 1.6 liter dual overhead cam variant that made 110 horsepower. And this time, the partnership really paid off. Toyota sold over 2,200 examples of the 1600 GT because the Japanese public really felt like they were driving a baby supercar when they were in this thing. Now, if I'm being frank, for Toyota, these little special edition cars were really a drop in the bucket compared to their global lineup. They were selling so many different cars with so many different engines, but one thing was very clear. Yamaha was Toyota's engineering golden goose. And so Toyota thought, maybe it was time to use some of that musical magic for cars that were a little bit more mainstream. Cars they would sell in droves. And so Yamaha was contracted yet again to develop a lightweight, compact, reasonably powerful engine for use in the Carina, Corolla, Celica, and MR2. That engine was the legendary 4AGE. It started life as a standard Toyota 4A, making about 70 horsepower. But Yamaha once again went to the lab and developed a dual overhead cam 16 valve version of it. The valve angle was an impressively wide 50 degrees with big intake ports and fuel injection. Plus, Yamaha used a variable induction system that used butterfly valves in the intake runners to maximize air velocity. This resulted in a 50 horsepower increase to 120 horsepower. A 50 horsepower increase in an engine that made 70 horsepower, all by just swapping out the cylinder. Head. The 4AGE was famously the engine that lived in the AE86 Corolla, and it was an extremely popular choice for racers and drifters for years to come. It was revised a number of times and saw power increases in every generation. They even later made a 20 valve version that used variable valve timing and five valves per cylinder, bringing output to 160 horsepower in the early silver top versions and 165 in later black top versions. Truly an impressive output for a little 1.6 liter engine. Now, so far, Yamaha had been excelling in making these little Toyota engines go fast which makes sense. Their motorcycle business was built on making tiny engines make a little more than tiny horsepower. But in 1984, at the very same time they were working on Toyota's little 1.6, Yamaha was contacted by a totally different car company, Ford. And well, if there's one thing that Ford is known for, it sure as heck ain't tiny little engines. Oh no. Ford meant big cars with big motors. But you see, that's where the problem lies. You see, the mid 80s was right in the swing of the big front wheel drive transition for automakers around the globe. GM and Chrysler already had the A body and K platforms respectively, and Ford was playing catch up. Their rear wheel drive Ford LTD was a horrible seller. And a new front wheel drive car was slated to replace it, but it needed to be a home run. And so they brought the world the Ford Taurus, a mid-sized family hauler with either an inline four engine or the three liter Vulcan V6. Long story short, the Ford Taurus was an absolute knockout. People loved that thing. My family had a dark green Ford Taurus station wagon and we drove that thing all around the country. But even in V6 trim, the Taurus only made 140 horsepower. And Ford couldn't have that. They were the makers of the fire-breathing Mustang. And a model that became as popular as the Taurus needed to live up to the Ford name. Enter Yamaha. Ford saw what they were doing at Toyota and wanted a piece of that action. And so Yamaha was given that 140 horsepower Vulcan V6 and told, make some magic happen. And make magic, they did. The oversquare design of the Vulcan V6 meant that it was an engine that wanted to rev. It just needed a cylinder head that let it. So Yamaha created a high-tech dual overhead cam system with a variable length intake manifold, which let it sing to 7,300 RPM, all while making 220 horsepower. And this engine was a looker too, with its complex snaking intake manifold as the crowning jewel on top. The car that was bestowed this lively V6 was the Taurus SHO or super high output. And considering the Mustang's five liter V8 made only about 210 horsepower, this Taurus definitely earned the SHO badge. Ford sold over 15,000 of these in the first year alone. So it's safe to say that this was another gangbuster success for Yamaha. Yamaha was now a worldwide engineering superstar. And so where else to go but the biggest of big leagues for engine makers? Formula One. Yamaha began supplying the Zaxby team with a five valve, three and a half liter V8 engine. And it revved to 10,000 RPM and made over 600 horsepower. But as it turns out, in Formula One, 
you need more than an engine to succeed. Yamaha never won a single race in Formula One. Not with Zack Speed, nor with Brabham in 1991, or with Jordan in 1992, or Terrell through 1996, or Arrows in 1997. Eight years of massive spending, countless hours of R&D, and pretty much nothing to show for it. And that was a big failure for the executives at Yamaha. But it didn't matter too much, because thankfully, all the while, Yamaha was back in bed with Toyota, developing another fantastic four popper, the 3S GE. This was a two liter inline four with the same philosophy of all the engines that preceded it. A stout Toyota engine as the base and killer Yamaha tech in the head. It started as a 150 horsepower lump in the Japanese Camry and Corona, but slowly over time, Yamaha continued to develop it. And eventually it became the Celica GT4's 3S GTE turbo engine, which dominated rally stages around the globe. And later, the Beam's 3S GE, which was Toyota's go-to naturally aspirated high revving screamer of an engine, fitted in the JDM Altezza RS200, making 207 horsepower from just two liters. Yamaha's 3S was so good that Toyota ditched the 2JZ in their GT500 Supra and opted instead for a TRD built version of the 3S GTE, one that made nearly 500 horsepower all while weighing far less than the heavy iron 2JZ. And then in 1997, Ford came back for second when it tasked Yamaha with building a peppy four-cylinder engine for the Ford Puma. It was called the ZTEC SE not to be confused with Honda's VTEC. And it was a high-tech 1.7 liter four-cylinder engine with a great flowing head that made plenty of jam. At this point, it's safe to say Yamaha had truly evolved from what they used to be. Gone were the days of making elementary school organs and machinery for their fellow countrymen. Yamaha was now an engineering first firm. And they wanted to innovate in the creation of anything and everything. And by the turn of the century, they pretty much were making everything. Pianos, drums, guitars, brass instruments, woodwinds, violins. But even beyond that, semiconductors, speakers, microphones, sporting goods, home appliances. Yamaha made the first commercially successful digital synthesizer, the Yamaha DX7 in 1983. And in 1988, Yamaha shipped the world's first CD recorder. And of course, their motorcycle business was still huge. They were selling any and all sorts of bikes. And on top of that, they had never stopped racing. Having created Yamaha Motor Racing in 1999 as a factory effort for MotoGP, and over the years, winning 39 world championships. Not to mention 208 victories at the Isle of Man TT, the most psychotically awesome race on the face of the planet. But in the early 90s, one thing happened that well and truly humbled them. You see, while they were deep into their Formula One engine making career, they decided that it only made sense for them to bring to market their very own car. A car that was pure Yamaha from top to bottom. No Toyota, no Ford, or any other car manufacturer that would steal the limelight from their engineering expertise. And since they were already making an F1 engine, it made sense for this to be a supercar. They named the idea the OX99-11, named after their current F1 race engine, the OX-99. And they approached a German engineering company to make the initial design. And a whole bunch of time and money later, it turned out that the design they made was a bit too cookie cutter sports car for the guys at Yamaha. And so the German guys got dropped and they contracted international automotive design out of England to pick up where they left off. Those guys developed a bonkers looking single seat race car for the road. It had a full carbon fiber body, a single canopy door that swung open, and it was of course propelled by the OX99 F1 engine. But Yamaha said, no, I think we want a two seater instead. And so back to the drawing board they went. And after months and months and many dollars spent. IAD and Yamaha just couldn't come to an agreement about the project. And so international automotive design was dropped and the project was assigned to Yamaha's own engineering firm, Ypsilon Technology. And the executives at Yamaha told Ypsilon, you have six months to finish this project or we're scrapping the entire thing. Conveniently at the time, Japan was having a financial crisis and a car that was likely going to be a loss leader while still costing $800,000 MSRP probably wasn't the most appropriate thing to do in an economic recession. So can you guess what happened? Yeah, they scrapped it. It was another big failure for Yamaha. And it seemed like anything involving Yamaha's Formula One development was destined for failure. Thank the Lord they still had those manufacturer partnerships then, because even when it all went wrong, it was projects like the Toyota 3S and the Ford ZTEC engine that kept Yamaha in the green. Lucky for them then, that in 1999, the seventh generation Toyota Celica was coming out. And Toyota was ditching the venerable 3S engine for something all new, something that was soon to be known as the 2ZZ GE. You see, the 1ZZ already existed, but it was boring. It was in cars like the Corolla and the RAV4. And it was clear to Toyota that the top line version of the Celica needed something special 
something only Yamaha could provide. So they commissioned Yamaha to work on the ZZ engine and create a new cylinder head. Together, Toyota and Yamaha created a new lightweight rotating assembly. It had forged connecting rods, redesigned pistons, a high compression ratio, and the all new VVT LI technology. VVT LI or variable valve timing and lift intelligent allowed the engine to adjust valve lift, duration, and timing. Basically Toyota's advanced version of VTEC. Simply put, you could rev the piss out of this engine without sending a valve up to meet great grandma in heaven. The end result was the Celica G GTS, a car that made an impressive 180 horsepower at 8,200 RPM. Hell, the 2ZZ Celica was so impressive that Lotus decided to use the ZZ engine in their Lotus Elise when they brought it to the US. At this point, Yamaha's grubby handprints were on cars from America, Europe, and Japan. So why not add Sweden to the mix? Out of left field, Volvo contracted Yamaha to make them an engine. It does kind of make sense because Volvo was owned by Ford at the time. Putting it simply, Yamaha took Ford's 3.4 liter V8 engine from the S SHO and developed the B8 444S. This was a 4.4 liter V8 transversely mounted with aluminum heads and blocks. The engine made its debut in 05 in the Volvo XC90. And let me tell you some of the nerdery from this engine. To fit a transverse V8 in an engine bay that was originally meant for inline fives, a 60 degree cylinder bank angle was needed instead of the traditional 90 that you find in most V8s. And to retain the 90 degree V8's firing order, it used offset crank journals. And because it was still such a tight squeeze, the left left and right cylinder heads are offset from one another. Meaning, unlike almost every other engine, it isn't even symmetrical. Yamaha was the exact kind of company to pull some nonsense like this off. And they did it. The B8 4S made 311 horsepower and 325 pound-feet of torque, all while meeting the ultra low emissions vehicle standard, the first V8 to ever do so. And the engine was so well received that by 06, Volvo ended up putting it in the S60 as well. Okay, sure, the engine went into an SUV and a sedan. So if that doesn't impress you, this was also the same engine used in the Noble M600. But the one in the Noble was mid-mounted and twin turbo to make 614 horsepower. It seemed that with every new engine and new collaboration, Yamaha was doing more and more interesting things to push the envelope of engineering further and further. This V8 not enough for you? No worries. In 2007, Toyota asked Yamaha to work on a V8. This time, it was for the Lexus ISF. This was the first ever Lexus F car, F being their new sports car sub-brand. And so Toyota had to hit it out of the park. So of course, you put Yamaha up to bat. The ISF's engine was based on the 1UR V8 found in the LS460. But once again, cylinder heads came off, thrown in the garbage. They were totally redesigned with a wider valve angle, bigger intake ports, and larger valves. Then the bottom end was forged and the valve covers were cast from magnesium. Toyota's idea was that for an F car to even exist, it needed to achieve the limitless depths of power, response, and sound. The end result was the five liter 2UR GSE V8. It made 416 horsepower with a 7,300 RPM redline, and it is heralded as one of Lexus's best ever motors. And it was thanks to the success of the ISF and that V8 power plant that the Lexus F cars had a solid foundation to grow on for years to come. That very same V8 got improved and iterated on over the years to eventually make 480 horsepower. But it turned out that for Toyota, the 2UR V8 was simply the hors d'oeuvres before the main course. You see, Toyota had been working on a secret project with Yamaha as early as the year 2000. It was something that harkened back to where it all began for Toyota and Yamaha, the 2000 GT, a halo supercar for the brand. The project was codenamed TXS, and it was intended to showcase the absolute peak of engineering at both Toyota and Yamaha. And those two companies toiled away in their secret facilities for years. And then finally, in 2005, Toyota showcased to the world a prototype at the Detroit Auto Show. It was called the LFA concept car. It was impressive, a sleek, minimalist, iconically Japanese sports coupe that really had some presence. But as quickly as it came to wow the world, it vanished. Toyota went radio silent about the car and it didn't make another appearance until two years later in 2007. That was when a slightly more finished LFA concept was shown alongside Lexus's first F car, the ISF. But again, nothing came of it. There was no news of production just a futuristic concept car to show off the F department's capabilities in design. And then, as if they hadn't already led us on enough, the next year in 08, they showed off a LFA Roadster concept. But finally, in 2009, Akio Toyota confirmed publicly that the LFA was to enter production. And it was to be called the LFA, just without the hyphen. And it was there that Toyota revealed to the world that they were working in conjunction with Yamaha to develop the LFA's bespoke, high-revving, 
4.8 liter V10. That V10 was called the 1LR GUE. The design goal was simple. It was to be a V10 that was as small as a V8 and as light as a traditional V6. Yeah, simple. To pull this off, Yamaha used copious amounts of magnesium, aluminum, and titanium in various parts throughout the engine. They also narrowed the bank angle from the traditional 90 degrees to 72 degrees to keep it light and compact. The same approach that you saw in those Volvo engines. And this V10, it was all about response. It was chosen over a V8 with the same displacement so we could rev higher, all while still having a lower reciprocating mass than a V12. There were 10 individual throttle bodies and a dual stage variable intake manifold, again, all in the name of response. And the LFA was able to rev to a red line of 9,000 RPM with fuel cut off at 9,500. And the car could rev from idle to red line in just 0.6 seconds, thus making a traditional tachometer incapable of keeping up with how fast the revs move. And at 8,700, RPM, it reached its peak rating of 553 horsepower. This engine was truly a showcase of Yamaha's mastery of the internal combustion engine. But if there's anything that we learned outside of Yamaha and their engines, is that they were masters of the art of sound as well. Those 10 individual throttle bodies were connected to an intake system with a carefully ribbed intake plenum. The plenum was designed in conjunction with Yamaha's music department so that the air traveling into the engine vibrated the ribs like a string instrument and produced a very unique sound. And then the intake had not one, but three separate ducts through the firewall into the main cabin so that two different octaves of engine music could be heard by the driver as that V10 screamed to 9,500 RPM. On top of that, the titanium exhaust system was designed with symmetrical lengths and a valved chamber. And the result was an engine that sounded like nothing that came before it. And Toyota and Yamaha were so sure of this one LR engine that they entered it into the Nürburgring 24 hour race in 2009, a year before the car was even released. The LFA took four in its class with one of the drivers being Akio Toyota himself. A year later, in 2010 at the same race, the LFA won its class. And in that same year, the LFA was finally sold to the public. And boy, was it expensive. Like, $375,000 expensive. And despite how stunningly impressive the car was, it was constantly criticized for being bad value compared to other supercars at the time. There were faster cars on the market for half the cost. But as the years went on, people began to realize the LFA was never meant to compete with cars that were half the cost. It wasn't meant to compete with anything. The LFA was simply an engineering exercise for Toyota and Yamaha, two companies that prided themselves on their engineering prowess, and two companies that held a long-standing mutual respect for one another. 500 LFAs were produced and sold, and you can see, today, they're worth far more than their original list price. The LFA is Toyota's greatest achievement, and the 1LR GUE is certainly one of Yamaha's as well. So. You get it now, right? Yamaha has always been the quiet brainiac at the back of the class that helped everyone with their homework. Yet, despite their relative anonymity, few companies have as much weight in their name as this one. Just mentioning the fact that an engine was built by Yamaha brings feelings of adoration and reverence to the hearts of JDM fanboys and muscle car enthusiasts alike. So it's no surprise then that a company with a reputation like that is now the world's largest manufacturer of instruments or the makers of banging AV equipment like the Yamaha HS5s that I have on my desk. Hell, they probably make the engine in your generator and lawnmower sitting inside your garage right now. And even as the world moves on from the internal combustion engine, which was Yamaha's bread and butter, I have no doubt that they will be at the forefront of creating the most advanced and intelligent versions of the newest and latest technology. Even today, they're working on advanced projects like a hydrogen version of the 2UR V8, one that uses a totally new head and a bonkers eight to one exhaust manifold to produce 455 loud and angry horsepower, all while using zero zero fossil fuels. But wherever the future takes them, I think we can all be grateful. Grateful that Yamaha worked and toiled to create some of the greatest engines that the world has ever seen, silently and humbly from the background. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't already. And we have a Patreon if you would like to support the channel. I'll see you guys in the next one. 